Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of the Earth and Hand podcast. Today my guest is Jim Gale from Food Forest Abundance. Welcome, Jim. Oh, thank you, Scott. It's wonderful to be chatting with you here. We've known each other for quite a while, and I love the work you're doing. Equally, man, equally. I'm such a fan of yours, and you're doing a great job of getting the word out about permaculture and such a great spokesman. It is really an honor to have you here. And Food Forest Abundance, foodforestabundance.com, everybody. Just go there right now. Check out what Jim is doing. Um, you know, when we first met, I remember you had some really compelling business opportunities to, you know, franchise and sell things like raised bed gardens. And, and so now you're, you're blossoming. You guys are expanding. You have, uh, you have a food forest in Florida called Galt's Landing, right? Yep. Yeah. And uh, 50 plus acres of uh, food forest you planted over the last couple of years. And it's, it's really going off and you have a lot of tours and people coming out, getting inspired. And that's, that's what it's all about. So it is. And there's a couple of things. So I actually started and paid a lot of money um, over some time to create a franchise model. And when I was done after spending over a year and a quarter million dollars, I had a 330 page document and it made me sick to my stomach. And I threw the whole pile of shit in the trash um, because it represented the legal system that is really enslaving humanity. It was all about control and force and violence. And if you don't do this, then this is gonna happen. So I threw it in the trash. And we now have like a two page document that is based in the permaculture ethics and principles. We have no hooks. There's no force and violence in our contract at all. If somebody chooses to do something unethical, we simply quit working with them. If they decide that we're not of value, they simply quit working with us. It's so simple. It's all about voluntarism. And then also you mentioned the 50 acres. We, yes, we do have a 50 acre property called, um, we called the development Galt Landing after John Galt from Atlas Shrugged. And we started with a completely blank canvas. And we currently have what I would say would equal about in two acres of food forest on the 50 acres. Now, maybe it's, maybe it's more like three and a half or four, but as far as a high density food forest, we, what we've put in now would represent probably two acres. The beauty of that two acres over the last 16 months is it has been a nursery that has expanded so fast and so beautifully that we've propagated over a thousand plants from that nursery just in the last 16 months and it's continuing to expand exponentially. Outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It, it's, it's, in fact, I can show you a couple pictures now of what it was like 16 months ago, if you want. Sure. Yeah. Be my guest. All right. So are um, you guys selling plants as well? Yes, um, we are. Well, well, mostly we're we we do a lot of tours and uh -huh. we give away a lot of stuff with the tours, right? So people can check out our tours at galtswalks.com. And then I love giving tours. And so far, with probably somewhere in the neighborhood of seven or 800 to a thousand people over the last 16 months who visited some big groups and then a lot of individuals. Um, we are a hundred percent with the ability to inspire people. <laughs> Nobody has left uninspired um, except for maybe a couple of kids that were just bored, silly and hot, <laughs> but a hundred percent of adults have left feeling better than when they arrived. That's huge. So can you see this picture? Is this? Oh, yeah. OK, so this was a cattle pasture. And I'm being called to share something that's so profound. What the government will allow us to do, government means mind control. What they will allow us to do here is use poisons and cut everything down. 
what we have done is illegal in the eyes of governmente, right? We have put in a diverse food forest that builds life exponentially. So this was, in, in some areas, this particular area, this is allowed, right? In other areas, it's not allowed, which I just find so amazing. But point is, this was last March. And you can see those bananas, they're just tiny. And you can really see just a few more things in the ground. This picture was taken by a drone about seven and a half or so months later. It says, yeah, seven month old food forest, right? So you can see it growing and starting to fill in. Then we got, um, let me see where, oh, then this picture, this is about nine months in. And the whole thing is starting to produce a massive amount of food. And we are demonstrating freedom in every conceivable way. We do not ask the government for permission for anything anymore. We demonstrate service to our community. We built a food forest at a local school. We're helping the community grow food. We're inspiring and empowering people to live self-reliant, healthy, wonderful lifestyles. Outstanding, 100%. Yeah, you guys are just on the very edge of this global awakening, you know, just helping wake everybody up and just demonstrating physically what's possible. You know, when we eat from our garden, the food tastes different. It's way better. Yeah. It's, it's grounding you with the land at that location. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's like printing money. That's what you always say. You know, oh, I got I know. abundance on my trees. I'm printing money yes. right here on my tree. Those, those people who say money doesn't grow on trees, they're completely ignorant. Yes, it does. Real wealth, not fiat. In fact, that's what we need to do in the world right now is we need to compost the fiat, right? We need to turn that fiat, which is going down in value exponentially right now. We need to turn that into life. The best investment that I've ever made is investing in a food forest that will produce exponential energy for my family, my friends, my community forever. Most definitely. Definitely. Yeah, that's that's the way to go. I mean, wow, right on. I'm glad you're demonstrating it, you know, and actually putting it into into this physical manifestation. Um, I, I want to back up for the audience and just point out like some of your accolades, Jim, because, you know, even I didn't realize like we talked a bunch of times and you're such a humble guy. But, um, you know, you were you were actually a really accomplished businessman at a pretty early age, 30 years old. You had a very uh, established like mortgage lending company. And, you know, that I think also that gets people's attention. Like, wow, this guy is serious. You know, you took all that energy, you created, you retired early essentially, and you took all that uh, monetary wealth. And now you're, you've dedicated all your time and energy and money into permaculture and promoting that on a global scale. Four times it's in cool. my life, about every 10 years, interestingly, I have written down a, an inspiring vision. And the first time I was 19, my college wrestling coach told everybody, it's time to write your goals. And I didn't want to because it involved a pen and paper and it seemed like homework to me. And I was not into homework. I was a daydreamer through school. And in fact, what was going on in my head was so much more exciting than what was going on at the front of the room. I simply couldn't pay attention. You know, if uh, ADD would have been a label back then, I'm 53 now, but it wasn't a label because if it would have been, they would have probably tried to put me on some drug made in a pharma, <laughs> you know how that goes. So anyway, um, I wrote my goals and thanks to my coach and thanks to listening to a tape series called The Psychology of Winning by Dennis Waitley. I was 19 years old. And I was on a long car trip to Texas and back. And I listened to this tape series over and over and over again on this car trip. And it blew my mind. I didn't realize what was possible for us as individuals until I listened to that tape series. So then when I'm writing or reading the questions regarding goals, what is the highest and most incredible vision that you can hold for yourself? And I started reading those questions and something shifted in me. And I had failed radically the two previous years. 
And when I wrote down that I wanted to be a, a three-time All-American wrestler and a national champion, my coach laughed. Um, and, and he's, a, I love him. He, he just, based on my history, he had a belief system that, Jim, that's impossible. There's no way you can achieve these goals. And four years later, I was a four-time All-American and national champ inducted into the Hall of Fame thanks to writing the goals, thanks to creating the, not, not only writing the goals is the representation of creating the vision that blows up your belief systems, that literally just shatters what you think is true and possible. So then I moved to Hawaii and um, then I backpacked through about 37 countries on a backpacker's budget, An incredible trip, right. lived with the Maasai, lived in the jungles of Chiang Mai, did touristy things and also very local things. And then I got home and while I was traveling, I was studying the great minds of history and reading all the books, Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. He, he deducted, by the way, and this is so relevant. After studying the most successful manifestors in the history of the world, he deducted based on his lifetime of study, whatever your mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. And so I started playing with that. So I wrote my goals again. I was dead broke when I got home at 29, almost 30. And I wrote that I wanted to be retired in three years. And now I had traveling experience. I had bartending experience with bar management and a teaching degree. And um, about three and a half years later, thanks to a series of divine cooperative incidences and synchronicities, uh, my mortgage company, which I started from scratch with no industry knowledge, went from zero to $1.3 billion in revenue. Because I had no filters and I, I didn't have any industry knowledge, which means I didn't know the rules of the game. Uh, you know, screw the rules, right? There's no, the rules are self-imposed by the rulers or by ourselves. I don't believe in rulers, right? So, Anyway, that was great. Then I bought a boat, lived on the ocean. I moved to Costa Rica. And that's when I learned about permaculture. And I also red pilled. I learned what was going on in the world. I learned how we are destroying our planet. And I learned what the cause of the destruction is. We humans are part of the problem, but we are not the problem itself. The problem itself is literally mind control, it's government, it's this belief in the people who are poisoning and destroying and subsidizing and creating monopolies and investing in through their corporatocracy, their fascist ways, investing in the systems that are destroying the world, the poisons and the poison producers and the centralization of power, you know, and the ultimate representation of that is an entity called Black Rock which is run by a computer named Aladdin. This isn't conspiracy. Anybody can look this up on Google, right? BlackRock did between 10 and $21 trillion investing in the entities that are sucking the life out of humanity. So it seems to be based on their deeds, you shall know them, that BlackRock is not only the name, but the intention of the entity. So to know that means very simply to stop doing that, to start investing in life again instead of death, to start using our energy to serve and to create life in this epic world, this natural God-given system. So that's what I've been focusing on is the new question, how do we catalyze a shift in awareness that leads to mass adoption of simply loving again, using our resources wisely again, serving our friends, our families, and ourselves again, in a way that creates life. Yes, well said, well said. Yeah, I mean, we talk about solutions all the time here at Earth and Hand, <laughs> but it, it comes back to, you know, the regenerative lifestyle, uh, the permaculture ethos and the design principles where the problem is the solution, right? Um, so we gotta talk about the problem sometimes to realize like, how can this problem be transmuted into oh. a solution? Um, so yeah, but it's people, I think nowadays, most people I know are just overwhelmed by the problems. And so, um, you know, I try to really just pump out the solutions as much as possible because um, it's good for people to hear that. Um, 
but I think the, the really good work is in the fine line of navigating the, the modern world and bringing back, you know, this ancient wisdom, like the indigenous people you traveled and met and, and the indigenous knowledge of how to work with the earth. It's coming from all over the earth. We got to navigate that and work that into this modern situation, the modern society right now. And yeah, makes it beautiful, which is, is tricky to do. You know, I'll, I'll acknowledge, I think. It's um, trickier not to. Yeah, but I mean. Because not doing it means death of everything. No choice, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it's really tricky not to do it. So it's very <laughs> logical to do it, right? And you, I loved what you yeah. said about permaculture is about turning the problem into the solution. So stepping back from the energy, the emotion of the problem. And I spent, I spent really quite a bit of time in scarcity because I was so involved in the problems, right? So I understand very clearly what the problems are, you know? And by the way, awareness, the word choice is almost always misused because the word itself implies that there is an awareness. If there's not an awareness, then there is no choice. Right? So then to create awareness without getting energetically sucked into the pain and suffering of it, just say, this is a problem and looking at it from an energetic perspective. And I'll give you two solutions that are logical on every single level and will radically change the world. Right? If the government, if somebody who is running for office, I don't believe in politics like many parasites. I do not believe in that. What I do believe in is policy right? If some politician running for office right now said, here's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring permaculture to all the prisons in America. And the inmates are going to grow all of their own food. They're going to eat healthy poison-free food because they're growing it on site. And they're going to learn the ethics and principles of permaculture. If that one thing were done from the top down, I don't believe in a top or a ruler, but it is what it is, right? Right now, our government and corporations are coming together and they're creating this prison system that breeds more hostility and negativity. If that system, that energetic system was inspired to do what's best for everybody involved who likes life, then every prison would have permaculture edible landscapes throughout and what would the results of that be? Do you have any idea? Well, I imagine it would be profitable. <laughs> it would and end. Would be happy. It would. It would, for the most part, right? Which means fifty-one percent or more. It would end crime in the United States of America. And how do I know that? Because it's been tested and done before. Uh, and you can look this up, go online and said gardening programs in prisons. In one study, in many, the recidivism rate was cut massively. In one particular program that wasn't even a permaculture based program, it was a pilot program. In other words, it can get a lot better. Yeah. In one program, the recidivism rate was cut from 35, actually it was more than 35% to under 10%. That's huge that's virtually the end of the majority of crime in our world so that's one solution right is a politician saying that yet not yet but when we continue to share this message share this video with your favorite politicians say this is the solution to crime in the united states of america if they ignore the solution then it's a result of one of two things ignorance or intention, which would be considered evil, right? Destruction. So when we share it in a way where they have no other choice but to do it, otherwise we're simply not gonna pay any attention to their blabbering, then they will either do it or they'll just go bye-bye. Here's another one. Imagine that same politician um, exclaiming very publicly, if I become president of these United States of America, which is a corporation at war with itself, then every school will teach permaculture, the ethics and principles of permaculture. And the students will grow their own school lunches at school. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people immediately think that's hard, right? 
that's the lie. That's one of the fundamental lies in our world. Permaculture proves that it's ridiculously, as, as Bill Mollison said, it's embarrassingly simple, right? When you put a perennial edible landscape on the edges of the baseball fields and the soccer fields and all that, and you keep some area for food production, or if the school doesn't have that, then guess what they do have? They have a park that's pretty close by that students could turn a park into a permaculture food forest that would stack functions massively and that would raise the value, the health, the wellness, the energy of the whole community. What would be the result of that? The poisons would be out of the school lunches, the poisons would be out of the school land, and the students would be learned to be completely self-reliant. That one thing would completely change the world. Right, right. Yeah, I remember Mollison, he used to be so fond of just taking a nap in the garden, you know, going out and taking a nap in the food forest. And the, the truth is there, like what you say in uh, some of your recent interviews, you talk about, you know, once you get it planted, the thing tends itself. And it, it really is true. Um, if things are planted in the right way and the land is treated the right way, it's not too much work as things progress then you're, it's really paying you back infinitely. You know? Infinitely, it's exponential, right? You can count yeah. the seeds in an apple, but you cannot count the apples in a single seed. One seed has infinite possibilities. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, just, we're just learning to navigate. We're just going back to really the old wisdom and uh, the earth doesn't make more children than she can feed, that's yeah. for sure. No. Just like my banana plants, like my soil, in my thing, you saw it. We started with sand. So we dug a pond, almost four acre pond. It's 25 feet deep. We used the material from that pond to build our land up because we're on the edge of a flood zone. And then our land was just out of the flood zone, but we still, we wanted to build up. So we built our land up about six, seven feet where the houses are. In fact, we had a 500 year flood in late October. Right. And, and the pasture was completely underwater and knee deep in a lot of places. And so where our houses were, the, the water would have been right up to the base. It would have been in our house by probably a couple inches. So anyway, we built that up six, seven feet. And so the land that we started with was average of 10 feet underground. It was sand. There was no very, very little life in this land. And now by, by, we did put a lot of inputs in at the beginning. We got truckloads of mulch and soil. And then we put compost tea on it regularly and analemma water and humigenics and all the, you know, these different additives to spur the growth of life again, right? Compost tea being a no brainer for every garden in the world. It's so easy and so awesome. So what we started with was dead, dead and it's now explosion of life. Um, and where was I going to go with that? Well, one thing that's coming to mind is we've already propagated like a thousand plants out of there, not including the millions of seeds that are there and the thousands more of plants that can propagate out of there, right? A food forest by its nature will continuously expand because the wind, the rain, and the birds will come in. They'll eat the seeds and they'll fly over here and they'll plant a new fruit tree. It's so beautiful. Definitely. Yeah. Once you get it going, then more animals come, the system flourishes on its own. I've even heard stories about people who are in the desert, you know, somewhere that had been treated badly for generations and land was messed up and they just took dead branches from trees from somewhere else, from way down the way. There was a forest and they took branches to this dry flat place and they posted the branches into the ground. They dug a little hole and they planted these branches kind of like a little dead tree, you know, but they just put it there. And then over time, we're talking like a couple of years, because there were branches sticking out of the ground, the birds would come by and the birds would socialize and hang out on those branches and they would poop and they would plant seeds there. And then suddenly there was all these different species of plants growing up there in this, in this place, just by po posting a few, a line of dead sticks coming out of the ground, you know? Oh so, my God. Uh, life is just, anti-fragile you know life oh, will it's persist. just 
Yeah. And, and that's and why they need to keep adding poisons every couple months regularly. The sky, the water, the soil, poison, 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 poison. Is if all we did were turn our backs away from all the poisons and poison producers and let nature do her thing again, we'd have the Garden of Eden again in no time. Right. I st took Mexican sunflower for fun one time. There was a, a stick, a Mexican sunflower, and I just stuck it in the sand in an area, just sand. And I'm like, oh, we'll see what happens. It's like probably eight or nine months later right now. And the thing is just glorious. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah I mean, we're talking about uh, cultural shit. And so when I was back in college, you know, in around like 1998, um, I became aware of natural building and permaculture. I had never heard of those things. You know, I'm like 18, 19 years old. And I was like, wow, why, how come I was never taught about this? Yeah, <laughs> not good. But um, it really blew my mind. And I just realized this is a cultural problem. You know, this is, it's, it's the, the cultural aspect of the, whatever you call it, the modern world or the modern business and or the western world and it's everybody really the whole world went down the wrong path culturally and we need to kind of shift that back so everybody's a part of the same team you know we're all there's people holding back the destruction over here and then there's people promoting the solutions over here we're all part of the same team and it's it's a it's a grand cultural shift joanna macy talks about it and so it's it's just great to be in these times even though it's a little bit chaotic i think it's very rewarding work and we all came here for this purpose you know <laughs> no, the chaos somehow breeds wisdom because when we're suffering we ponder and we wonder and we ask new questions and we open our minds to new ideas when we think we're all cool we just party and don't really pay attention so we've been partying for a long time and now we're starting to see the cracks in the gluttony and all the different things that we've been experiencing and uh, yeah, it's, we're, it's like we're in the Great Awakening. It's happening all around us right now. And it's a beautiful thing if you're focused on the joy and service and love and beauty and creation of it. If people are focused on the stress of it, there's more dis-ease and disease now than any time in the history of the world. Right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I remember, you know, when I first took a permaculture design course, I think it was like 2005, Larry Santoyo and Toby Hemingway, amazing, mind-blowing class. And one of the, they had many great examples, but one of the examples that sticks with me is a place called uh, Songhai. So this is in, I think, Niger or somewhere in West Africa. Songhai is named after the more ancient, you know, Songhai Empire, which was one of the greatest empires in West Africa and in the world, actually. But this uh, permaculture place called Songhai, it's still there. As far as I know, they have thousands of acres and uh, they set up, they built, you know, using some machinery, they altered the landscape and they built this uh, lake that's several thousand acre lake, wow. it's a huge lake. Then they started stocking it with these super fast growing African fish, they're local to that area, that these fish like quadruple in size every year or something. They're, they're really fast growing and they're really good to eat. And so, and then they started, you know, this is social permaculture, right? They started with the volunteerism and they told all the people anywhere near there, nobody has a job, you know, everybody's trying to just subsist. They're barely making it. Um, the land needed some repairing, you know, so they bring the water back, they bring these fish in and they tell everybody, you can fish this lake as much as you want, and you can sell these fish. You just need to bring us, uh, you know, whatever it was, like a third of the profits or something. And so they would, you know, keep records. How many fish did you get? And then, okay, off you go, and you go sell those. And if somebody didn't bring them back the right share of the profits, they just like, okay, we're not going to work with you anymore. And it was just like that. And it, yeah. it's just flourishing, you know, and they created yeah. so many opportunities, so many jobs if you want to call them that yeah they're jobs livelihoods you know were created from this body of water and so that one stands out very inspiring yeah we just had to reverse the uh desertification we got to reverse the economic stranglehold situation you know which really comes back to the the nuts and bolts the what's happening on the land 
and you know where's the water and how are the plants doing how are the animals doing and how are the people doing so i think there's a lot of hope we're saying yes right now and we can see the future clearly so to me that says like we're definitely going to get there and there's just so many brilliant people there's so smart and so informed and so many great methods and techniques and it's like we're all on the same team everybody's ready to go that i'm i'm 100 confident now we're gonna make it <laughs> yeah you know and i i've thought about this quite a bit what i recognize and this is one of the biggest leaps for me is, is to recognize that it's not about this physical experience right we're more than this from my perspective from my inner knowing and when i release the fear of the possibility of us not making it. When I released the concern, the worry, the scarcity, and literally just stepped into the present and into this idea that I'm gonna do the best I can because that's all I can do is the best I can. The thing is I can keep getting better by learning, by interacting, by using the permaculture principles, by accepting feedback and making adjustments and so on, right? And it's the ultimate stack of functions where I'm living a life now where I go take, I take naps most every day. I have all the food, water, and energy needs all around me. I have more friends, good friends I've ever had in my life. And it's just pure joy. And everybody can have this, right? 26 months ago, I was dead broke. I had lost, I invested $20 million. I went from zero to 20 million to negative $80,000. It took me a while to lose and invest that much money ignorantly, but every piece of the puzzle was, there was a reason and I don't regret anything, right? And when I stepped into faith and courage, the frequency, the energy of the presence, then the magic started again. And I invite everybody to step into the present because that's where it's all at. Well, that's quite a journey. I oh, can't yeah. hear much more about it as we continue talking yeah that's amazing i'd hope to get out to florida one of these days and see your farm oh i hope you can buddy there's yeah. so many things happening and with your experience i would love to have you out there and just collaborate and share ideas it's it's so great i mean there's so much going on and i've i've been thinking for you know about about 20 years i've been thinking like why would each person have their own land their own separate spot that it's, it's really hard to create you know cooperative close-knit communities that are close to each other why wouldn't we all have you know some kind of cooperation we should be within reach of one another have enough space but share in the expenses and the work to reform the land and plant the trees and and there's people doing it and so i'm more interested in like joining with other folks than you know just forging out completely on my own. I did have a homestead for a while and I tried that and it, it was a really good experience. I learned a ton. Um, I had a house on the Oregon coast and, you know, pretty established garden. I had an acre and had a forest. I was, you know, wow. farming the trees, cutting back some trees and, and I was building greenhouses and fixing the house and I had uh, chickens and it was an amazing experience. I, I recommend it. It's, people need to get in touch with, I think, you know, for me to get in touch with just that raw experience of like, what does it require to survive? You know, what is nature telling me? And what do I really need? What, what are my most essential ingredients? And so once you do that, then it becomes more obvious. Okay, well, this is, this is enjoyable. And yeah. It's just something you know yeah you can, and, and to thrive yeah. even like like yes about a, 10 days ago i was in an event and i ate a bunch of bread and i haven't been doing well with bread for years but it was the only thing around and i slipped up and i ate a whole bunch of bread that was growing <laughs> poisoned, and it messed up my my stomach Right. And I, I would live with it. I was not eating much. And I anyway, I lived with it for a while. And then all of a sudden, this gal sent me a, um, a note about papaya saying, and, and at first I looked at it and I gave it a, a heart, you know, thank you. That's kind of neat information. And then she sent me another thing. She said, 
I think you should really read that. Like, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Cause I, I kind of glanced at it, right? I get, a, I get like a lot of messages. And so I clicked on it and I opened it up and I read it. And I was like, oh my God. I walked outside, I went to one of our papaya trees. I took a papaya off that was about probably four or five days maybe or so from being completely ripe. So it was a little bit green in this couple of areas. Anyway, I took it back and I put it on video. This is life in a food forest. Anyway, I cooked it up with uh, butter and salt and I ate this papaya oh, with honey. So we have bees. So I put butter and salt and then honey from our beehives. I couldn't, I was shocked at how delicious it was. I'm like, what's going on? Why are we eating this type of stuff all the time? And my stomach ache is gone in 24 hours. Huh. It's like, it's all there. And, and to be aware of the messages as they're coming in, having the attention, intention, and attention to be aware of the messages that are all around us, that are coming to us. Right. At first, I wasn't aware and I didn't, didn't pay attention. And then my friend had the awareness to send another message saying, you should read this. Like, what? what's going on here? I mean, those types of things are happening all day, every day. It's truly mind blowing. Yeah, I agree. Gosh. Uh, so my partner is a vegan chef and a holistic health consultant. Ming Ming, she's wonderful. And I learned a lot from her. We pay a lot of attention to, you know, our, our diet, our supplements. And, and I honestly, I don't think I could do what I do without, you know, taking this, the proper minerals and the nutrients, you know, and, you know, I take like chloroxygen, for example, this is mm. yeah, chlorophyll and hemoglobin are very similar molecules. I don't know exactly how it works. I'm just saying it, if you take some chloroxygen one day, you'll be like, wow, I have so much energy because it's oxygenating your cells, you know? So this type of stuff is just, it, we really have a great opportunity, you know. To be I mean, is it C-L-O-R and then O2? Uh, C-L-C-H-L-O-R oxygen. Yeah, there's several, several different brands, but that's just an example. I mean, every morning I'm taking, you know, nettle, stinging nettle tinctures, you know, um, pine pollen, pine bark, ginkgo, you know, it's just all these medicines, the plants are there for us. They're, they are our greatest allies and they are. Uh, can't do it without them. So they, they are our greatest allies. And then so are the wasps and the spiders and the geckos and all of the animals that come into a food forest. It's the balance. So I was walking by this particular area where we had these uh, perennial lettuces, like longevity spinach, Okinawa spinach, sweet potatoes, and moringa. We, we make these salads, cranberry hibiscus. They're just phenomenal. But anyway, this one time I looked and there was this one plant that was just destroyed. And I looked and there was larva. Some moth probably laid some eggs or a butterfly. I think it was a type of moth. And so the first day I'm just like, oh, that's interesting. We got so much of it around and I know what's gonna happen. So I'm not concerned about it. I'm just curious. And then the next day I went back and I noticed this plant was gone. And the next one was about a third gone, maybe half. And I noticed that there was a spider web there and I saw a wasp. I came back the third day and now there's wasps and spiders and geckos and there's no more larva, like very few, like the, the, the nature balanced itself out in such a beautiful way. Like I could just sit there and watch. It's like the, it's like a miniature war going on. I saw this wasp come down and grab one of the larvae and just tear it in half and eat it right there. It's like, that is so cool. That's amazing. And the mushrooms, oh, yeah, it's just, wow. So I want to talk a little bit about this marketing and, and, the business part, because like I said before, I think it's kind of a tricky transmutation right now because we need to fit in this really beautiful ancient wisdom into this kind of new and dying system, if you will, you know, we got to fit into this economy right now and make things, everything has to be profitable uh, for it to work out. And so I want to revisit our previous conversation. There's another really good YouTube video. I'll add the link below. 
uh, where you and I and your team talk about some of the possibilities of creating a regenerative home type homestead dwelling on your food forest abundance uh, package uh, homestead deal. So you're, you're creating these uh, couple of acres and a, and a home and a permaculture food forest already all done for you. And you're selling these as a package deal. Are you still doing that? Yes. Um, we launched about 27 months ago. It was Earth Day 2021. And we are now serving people, helping people grow food in every U.S. state and 54 countries around the world. And we're just getting started. Um, we have a team of designers, permaculture designers, that help with the design process. We help people. If you've got 20 bucks and you want to um, use that 20 bucks to not only buy food, but learn how to take the seeds out of the food and turn it into a garden, you could do that, right? If you want to speed up time, then the best thing you could ever do, if you have the financial resources, is to get a permaculture landscape design a detailed blueprint of your yard and your landscape. And it layers all of the factors in permaculture, the seven layers of a food forest. It contemplates all of the factors, the wind, the rain, uh, the zone, the agricultural zone, and what your goals are. And it puts it all into a design that you can then either DIY or you can have hire a crew. We've got 140 crews around the world that will do the install for you if you want. It's a landscaping service. It's the same price as landscaping. The difference is it's freedomscaping. <laughs> it's, it's maxed <laughs> up. So then the, the kind of the evolution of that process, we created a business model called a Freedom Farm Academy. A Freedom Farm Academy is a culmination of all of it. It puts it all together. So it's basically creating a off-grid modern homestead with all of the food, water, and energy needs met on site. And it includes education, demonstration, nursery aspects, and the ability to have your own teams that go out using your nursery, your Freedom Farm Academy as the foundation, and then go out into the community and help your community grow food, right? Food security is not only when we have enough food, but when our neighbors have enough food, then we have food security. 100%. That's amazing. So uh, where are we at in the process? A couple of people already purchased the permaculture homestead from you guys? We have had, well, we've had over 800 designs around the world. We have got installs going in all over the place. We've got 17, 16 or 17. I know there's a few more that are, are about ready to jump in right now. Um, we'll have probably 20 Freedom Farm Academies and we've got them in Asia and Africa, very soon in China and Russia, Canada, the United States, demonstration sites going in. And every site becomes a seed of abundance that will just scale. So we want thousands of these around the world, you know? And, and in fact, we're, we're not messing around like BlackRock. Sure, they're currently destroying the world, but we're inviting BlackRock to invest in life instead of death. Their computers metrics are based in how do we make the most profits, supposedly, right? Well, here's how you make more profits. They, they invested $21 trillion. 5% of that, 5%, $1 trillion invested in these Freedom Farm Academies, which are taking typically raw pieces of land and turning them into hyper productive permaculture paradises where the land value goes up massively and there's all these stack of, of value adds which can equal profits. Now that would equal a million, million dollar food for us around the world. Think of that, 5% of their current investment potential going into creating life would create a million, million dollar systems that's with fewer than 10,000 cities in the world, that's 100 per city, right? That's incredible. A $100 million food forest per city around the world changes the world. Mm -hmm. So come on, and Aladdin, invest in this. <laughs> Way to think big. I love that. Yeah. Investing, getting the folks that are all afraid, they're in scarcity and 
inviting them into the abundance, you know, abundance, like, you know, <laughs> dancing booty, you know, it's much more fun than scare city. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Nobody that's will great. realize it. If, if we invite them into the love, then, and if it's profitable, again, if it remains profitable, then there's no reason that it'll be a landslide. And, you know, when you go back and, and look, it, you can find that there's people that are uh, remediating. That's the word I'm looking for. Remediating um, neglected land around the world. You know, yeah, one of my former students came to an earth bag workshop I did in uh, 2009, I think it was, in Puerto Rico. This guy, Neil Spackman. You ever heard of him? I, I have, I think. Really cool guy. He was super soft-spoken, super humble. A few years after he left and he learned the earth bag technique at my workshop, pretty straightforward. He was doing land remediation in Saudi Arabia and he made like international news and they did this huge project where they blocked the water a little bit so they can create some moisture in the desert. So basically re-greening the desert, you know? And then since then he has a company called, uh, I think it's Regenerative Resources. Anyway, they're planting mangroves because it's, really, really strong plant that can grow and be watered with seawater. And they're planting it along the shores of desertified areas, uh, like in Mexico, and they're in these huge, huge contracts. I mean, more power to them. So there's a lot of remediation of these areas in the earth that, um, you know, were neglected. The ecosystem has been destroyed and they're, they're recreating it. So you got, you know, Jeff Lawton doing some interesting work. There's some great videos out there, what he did in Jordan. They got a swale, what is it, like a mile long swale, a couple of miles long on contour. And then suddenly, all of a sudden, there's mushrooms popping up in the desert. And the local people had never even seen mushrooms in their life <laughs> because there was never enough water, you yeah. know. And, um, and Roger Green, you know, so uh, one of my friends and mentor, Dan Winter, who I mentioned like every time because he's a dynamo and one of the leading like research scientists in the world, in my opinion. Um, He's part of a, a group of, of scientists and teachers and Roger Green being among them, Roger Green bloomed the desert. Um, everybody should check out all that stuff because I see so much potential and I myself, I'm looking online, I'm thinking, look, I could buy this land. The land I can afford right now is you know, out there in the desert. It's like not as choice, but we could take that kind of land and just recoup it and rebuild it and suddenly your, uh, your profitability and benefit to the earth and to humanity is exponential because you're taking something that's really not that valuable and you're making it super valuable. Yep. We're using yep. like, uh, they have machines, permaculture pitting machines where it's like a giant machine that rolls over the desert and everywhere. They make these little impressions and then all the seeds and all the water and all the animal dungs and everything go to the bottom in one place in this hole. And there's a little bit of shading. It's a little more shadowy in there. And suddenly in five years, the desert is blooming with bushes and trees without much more intervention than creating these, these pits. So it's so just tons of potential. And that's the, the path we're on. And it's so darn exciting. And I know that the, you know, the current control mechanism is trying to hold on, but there's no way they can. You know, can they create more destruction on the way out? Sure, and they will, and they are. But if we focus on the energy, the love, the frequency, the service of what you and I are talking about, if everybody listening goes outside and plants a couple seeds in your yard, you know, maybe watch some videos on permaculture and, and maybe put a guild together. Or if you want to go full on, then get a design, you know, uh, you learn how to be a designer. In fact, that's one of the bottlenecks is the permaculture design process. And so we just had, uh, I was on a Mike Adams show and a bunch of awesome comments made, it was really happy and everything. And one lady said the cost that of FFA, food forest abundance is way in big letters too expensive. She said, how could you expect anybody who's living on a fixed income to afford your design services? I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Our, we charge $997 for a starter food forest design in your backyard, which is incredibly detailed. Like the amount of money that our designers earn per hour is a fraction. It's between 30 and between 10 and 30% of what a professional in any other field earns. 
which is just completely BS, right? They might be earning 40 or 50 bucks an hour because it's a lot of time and energy that goes into the design process where by a lawyer, you know, legal is the undoing of natural law. A lawyer might make three, four, 500 bucks an hour to do what they do, which is actually taking life away from our society. So anyway, to anybody out there listening, if you are of the kind of organized architectural engineering mindset, permaculture design might be a career path for you. And what we know is going to happen is it's going to be very sought after, especially when you demonstrate the design potential. It's epic. Yes, I agree. Definitely. And, you know, me having been a designer of natural homes and builder for over 20 years now, things moved a little bit slower than I thought they would <laughs> when I was 20, but I've noticed an uptick recently. And I think it's just, you know, current events and people are feeling the pain, you know, the, the economy, things are a little bit different and people are thinking, wow, how can I uh, make allies with nature and also keep my family safe from toxins, and, you know, issues, toxic building materials, for example. Um, so I think the holistic design and natural homes, a natural home being like zone zero in your permaculture design plan, um, it's all coming to the forefront and it's tying in. And, and yeah, I think permaculture designers is gonna be a huge need for that um, now and moving into the future. And you know, people always tell me folks cannot afford my design services or they can't afford to bu even build a home and they're doing the best they can. And I mean, I get it, believe me, I that's why I offer the workshops. You know, I got the bioarchitecture primer course that's coming up in August and September and October. And it's a fraction of the cost of hiring anybody as a, like a custom designer. You get to learn how to design your own natural home, how to think in permaculture design and holistic design terms. And then you can participate in the design of your own home. Even if you hire somebody to help you, you can make it more affordable for yourself by doing it yourself and being involved. And it's more rewarding to be involved in the design. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. You know? and it's, so it's like life by design. It's so awesome to be a designer of your own life. That's kind of what goal setting is. It's kind of what prayer is, right? It's just start creating intention, putting it out, thought, word, deed, putting it out to the world and it will turn into matter. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I love it. I, I saw your interview with Mike Adams. I loved it. And what I see in a lot of interviews recently, I was watching like Haven Earth, for example, they're talking with, uh, what's his name, David uh, Edwards, you know, private membership associations. And there's this really interesting nexus right now, you know, like David Bros and John Bush and Exit and Build, you know, a nexus of the psychology, the spirituality, and the political. And the economic, you know, there's a nexus. And so um, I'm like, great, bring it on. I mean, I, I'm ready. I, we are pure consciousness. And if we just keep that in mind every day, then things will work out. Um, but yeah, there's, I think, a lot of room for, um, you know, just everybody sharing information and realizing, hey, you know, we don't need to ask permission to do X, Y, and Z. Um, this is the right thing to do for the earth. So we can, we can do it. You can it's easier to beg forgiveness than ask permission most of the time. <laughs> I'm not telling anybody specifically what to do. I'm just saying, you know, go out there and, uh, and try something, you know. Uh, break yeah, I want to share some on those lines. Like at Goss Landing, we don't have, we did not ask the government for permission to do what we're doing. And if they come at us with any type of threats or force and violence, then our best weapon will be the light of consciousness on camera, on film. We are going to be showing the individual perpetrators of this belief system of force and violence that they have the somehow the right to come and harm us. And we will put that all on film in a very clear way at scale to millions of people. And they don't want that. That's why they're not showing up, right? Because they don't want that because what we're doing is good. And it's recognized as good by everybody who freaking sees it, 
right? So I think that that's another layer. When we truly serve, when we do good and serve, then lawful trumps legal, right? Legal is way down here. It's actually part of the problem. Lawful is simply following the permaculture ethics, God's law, do no harm and serve. And then the reflection of that service will be a life of abundance. Well said, thank awesome. you, brilliant. Well, okay, I mean, uh, tell people uh, how they can get in touch with you. Um, when can they uh, hear you speak and, and uh, how can they uh, participate in what you're offering? Well, thank you so much, Scott, for, um, for the wonderful chat. Uh, they can, anybody out there can join us, you know, together we win. We have no patents, no NDAs, no non-competes, by the way. Everything we do is open source. It's about collaborating and coming together and changing the course of history, or at least being part of the new course that may be already happening with or without us. Um, and that is at foodforestabundance.com. So it's Food Forest Abundance. And we have newsletters. We are coming up with a, a platform where we're going to teach modern homesteading and all these different. We have TV shows. We're going to be on Discovery Channel, on Netflix, on another show, which hasn't been picked up yet, but it will be documentaries, songs, poetry. It's, it's just we're coming together. So we would love to have you, you know, or come together with you as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're doing everything we can. We're working together in the same direction. And it's it's so, so enjoyable and, and satisfying um, to be creating the dream together. And you're going to guest speak at the upcoming Bioarchitecture Primer Workshop yes. in September. So, yeah, thanks for coming through for that. We really appreciate it. You and uh, Larry Santoyo are the headliners concerning permaculture design. So well, it's going to be a lot of fun. And if anybody's looking for a speaker, I'm speaking at events all over the place. I love doing that. I love engaging with other, um, you know, thought leaders and people who are looking to inspire change. So yeah, I'm, a, I'm available for that. And also I wanna invite everybody to come visit us at Galt's Landing. It's, the website is galtswalks.com. So it's G-A-L-T-S-W-A-L-K-S.com. And come and uh, we'll give you a tour and we'll talk about how we change the world. Bravo. Thank you so much for being here, Jim. Thank Your you, Scott. Yes, you too, brother. Thanks for all the work you're doing. Ciao, everybody.